week's episode of Buckeye Football Weekly here on Buckeye TV. I'm your host, Brad Comer, and folks, we are jam-packed with topics to discuss this week. Is there a quarterback controversy in the OSU locker room? Does Wisconsin have the chance to upset the Bucks this weekend? All those and more covered on today's show. This week, I am joined by Scarlet and Gray Sports Radio's Jimmy Bloomfield and Mark Finch. Thanks for coming on on the program this week. Mark, I assume the voice is better. Yeah, the voice the is much better this week, yes. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy, you're joining us for a second straight week. A so, nice uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. Well, students, if you are in attendance for Saturday's game versus Florida A&M, there is no doubt you possibly witnessed the most lopsided game in your lifetime as an Ohio State fan. The game versus FAMU was ended in a Buckeye win well before the first quarter. In the 76-0 thrashing of the Rattlers, the season-high 603 total yards on offense was in large part due to Kenny Guyton. The backup quarterback threw for 215 yards and six touchdowns. And just a quick reminder, those stats came in the first half. For a second straight week, Guyton's performance earned him the Big Ten Co-Offensive Player of the Week for the second consecutive week. Smooth Jazz may be getting the nation's attention, but according to Urban Meyer, Braxton Miller's job is not in jeopardy. Uh, I think Braxton will probably start. He had a good day today, and, and looks like he's pretty close to 100%. I just want to make sure running the ball he's good too, and he was, and Kenny's good. So, um, right now we're still working through exactly how we're going to use the, you know, manage the game. But uh, they, both, they both look good. He looks good. I mean, he looks like he hasn't really lost a step. Um, Running wise, throwing wise, he, he looks fine. I mean, it's, but it's practice, so you never, never really know between practice. But we try to simulate as many game like events during practice as on Saturday. So when we come down to Saturday, he's ready. So I think he'll be ready. He'll be fine. All right, so fellas, as we just heard in uh, that sound bite, uh, Urban Meyer still going to choose Braxton Miller as his starting quarterback, despite sitting out against Florida A and M. Uh, just it was, it was. I guess on Monday it was a mutual decision. Urban Meyer kind of backpedaled a little bit, considering it was Braxton's decision on Saturday. Uh, should should we be worried about him not playing against FAMU? That was really the game where he was able to tune up and going into Big Ten play, but he sits out for basically three straight games. Uh, Jimmy, I'll start with you. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I'm starting to get a little more and more concerned because at after the San Diego State game, they said he would have been able to play, but the score was too lopsided for him to come in. Then Cal, he was a game time decision, didn't dress. This week was probable, didn't even dress again. Uh, it just seems like he needed to be out there against FAMU's team. We saw Guyton easily tear them apart. There's no reason Braxton couldn't just sit in the pocket, throw a couple passes, even if it's just one or two possessions to get some game reps in. Mm -hmm. And now with Wisconsin coming in, it's a little bit of a concern. And what about you, Mark? I don't know. I don't think he really needed to go out there. I think Braxton Miller knows how to play. I mean, this is going to be his third season playing Big Ten games. I think he, he has it. He has what he needs to do under his belt. He knows what he's doing. I think he's had some injury problems stemming all the way back into high school, and I think it's a good idea that he knows his body's limitations and decided to sit out this game that really wasn't a game. Yeah, even in his senior year at Wayne, he still, mm -hmm. you know, didn't play the, the full regular season schedule. So, yeah, good point in there bringing that up. Um, the question that everyone's been asking, and Mark, I'll go ahead and start with you on this one. Is there a quarterback controversy in that Ohio State locker room? You cannot deny what Kenny Guyton has done in basically the three straight games he's played. I know he didn't play one series in, in, against uh, San Diego State, but still. Uh, do you think that locker room is almost divided right now, considering how Kenny Guyton has played this year? And Braxton Miller, we all know how mm -hmm. great of a quarterback Braxton Miller is. Well, is, there, is there a controversy going on? I think there's a chance for the fact that there could be a controversy, but the sample size for Kenny Guyton is just not large enough. I mean, the Cal game, Kenny Guyton played very well, and that is impressive. But any quarterback who plays at Ohio State, I mean, we're the Ohio State University. Any quarterback here is going to put up those kind of numbers against FAMU. Mm -hmm. It's just going to happen. Braxton Miller would have put up numbers like that against FAMU. So I don't think there's a quarterback controversy. I think there is a chance that it does develop, though, if Braxton does not play well against Wisconsin. What are you, Jay? I agree. I mean, if Braxton struggles, there's definitely going to be a conversation about Kenny Guyton. But if Braxton Miller comes out against Wisconsin, lights out, and we – come out with a W, I don't think anybody's going to be questioning that it's Braxton's job. It was his job. Nothing changes that. You know, Urban said he's earned some time. Sure. Uh, how do you get both of them on the field? I mean, and how tough is it to just 
you know, going into Wisconsin, benching Kenny Guyton after everything he's done. How And, you know, just to build off that question, how do you play both at the same time? Not just that, at the same time, but how do you get Kenny Guyton enough snaps, even though Braxton Miller is going to be your starting and he's going to be getting 90% of the snaps? I mean, I see... You know, there's probably going to be some kind of formation where Guyton comes in with Braxton Miller, as you mentioned, and I'm sure that is being drawn up right now. Uh, but for the most part, it's going to be the Braxton Miller show, and it could just be kind of smokescreen that Guyton's going to be there. So Wisconsin maybe plans a little bit of their game plan around Guyton. But if Braxton Miller doesn't struggle, there's no reason to take him out of the game and steal reps from him, despite how well Guyton has played. I mean, I agree. I think the only formation that would make sense would be putting Braxton maybe in a slot position, but they're not going to do that with who Braxton is. They need to keep him healthy for the rest of the season if he is, in fact, the number one quarterback, which is what they're saying, and that's what I believe as well. So, I mean, that's really the only formation that makes sense to put them both out there, and I don't see that happening. Now, the last time we saw two quarterbacks in one formation, uh, 2009 Fiesta Bowl, Mm -hmm. Terrell Pryor and Todd Beckman. So I don't know if they're going to go down that route again. Urban Meyer said that if Kenny Guyton wanted to play wide receiver, he would be the starting wide receiver because why would you need another wide receiver out there? Slightly so the different situation, though, because back. Beckman was the starter. Yeah, then. Beckman was the starter. He didn't have an offensive line, so you had to put the new guy prior to the freshman out there. Um, Jimmy, where is Braxton's confidence right now as a quarterback? Uh, he hasn't played in three straight games. Uh, he is a top-five quarterback in the country, but Kenny Guyton, he, what he's shown, he's playing as a top five quarterback right. in the country, if not the best quarterback in the Big Ten conference this season. Uh, there has to be a bit of discomfort discomfort for Braxton Miller, seeing that his backup is playing as well as he's doing. Yeah, I'm sure he's still confident in how he can play the game, but the fact that he chose not to play does send a little bit of a signal that maybe he's not 100% healthy right now. And also the fact that all these students have gotten behind Kenny Guyton and now even some of just normal Ohio State fans. Really, it began with the students, though, and Kenny G chants and all that. On the <laughs> After that Purdue game, I think sure. that's when Kenny won over the student body. And, you know, it has to be in the back of his mind that if, he's, if he doesn't play well, there's a lot of pressure on him because then a controversy will be creative and he could lose a lot of fans. Yeah. But, I mean, there's also the old saying in football, the most popular player on the team is the backup quarterback, which is who Kenny G is. And he is one of the most popular players on the team because he, when he has played, he's played well. But I think people are forgetting what Braxton Miller brings to the table. I mean, he brings, to the, he brings one of the most dynamic football offenses in the Big Ten, maybe even the country. And he's definitely one of the most dynamic players in the country. He's every D coordinator's nightmare yeah. in, he's, in he's not, football right now. I think Kenny Guyton probably is a little bit ahead of Braxton in the pocket passing area, but Braxton's a better athlete, and he is the quarterback right now. So I, I don't know. I mean, it's just it, it's a really weird situation, especially with Kenny being the older player too. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the leadership's there with Kenny Guyton. Uh, the, the talent is there with Braxton Miller. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how I look at it. So I guess we can go with that. Uh, from what we have heard, uh, Braxton Miller's having a heck of a week um, this week in practice, Urban Meyer went and said that on Monday that he had a brilliant Sunday. Pretty much just did a lot of conditioning, but the teammates are behind him now, you, particularly the offensive line. Corey Lindsley brought something up that Braxton Miller is definitely ready to go this week. Um, I guess the one thing I have, do we expect to see some rust from Braxton Miller when he goes in against Wisconsin? It's Big Ten play. It's not Cal anymore. So, Mark, I'll start with you. Do we, are we going to see any rust with Wisconsin under the light Saturday night? I think there's a chance we do see some rust. I mean, Braxton Miller, not that positive of a passer, even before he was, even before he dealt with this injury this year. I think definitely in the pocket, you're going to see some rust. I'm just interested in seeing whether or not he's going to be afraid to run coming off his knee injury, or if he's going to be the same guy who just, he's going to run. I don't know where the offense is headed. The offense wanted to be more passing this year with Braxton, but missing all those games does kind of limit, you know, the practice he's had with that. And, this Wisconsin game, Ohio State needs to win. Yes. And if that requires Braxton to run, then that's what Urban Meyer is going to call. Even with that knee? Even, well, that's, see, that's the issue. I don't know. That's where we could see the rust. And it, it's, I don't know, it's just, a, it, it's just such an interesting predicament for the Buckeyes. I think Braxton Miller plays well. I think um, the first quarter is a little fidgety for him. He's got, he's got a little happy feet, but I think he, 
He settles in. I mean, he's going to have an 8 p.m. crowd behind him. So that that's, definitely will that's help. That's true. And what about you, Jimmy? I agree with the whole running situation. He's going to have to run if we want to win this game. And if he's going to be scared to run, that can't be something that we have. You can't have a scared quarterback out there. I think the best thing that could happen really is he takes a hit on one of the first couple plays of the games and that kind of wakes him up and gets him back into football mode mm -hmm. as if long they, as it's not chris borland right as long as it doesn't <laughs> as long as it, yeah exactly. damage, <laughs> he, should, he should take somewhat of a shot though and then you know that'll wake him up and say you know football's here let's go and i think then braxton will be fine mm -hmm. it's just how he reacts to getting hit for the first time if he's timid in the pocket for over a quarter because he hasn't gotten hit it's going to affect his play for sure all right let's quickly um take a look at the family game there's obviously there was not, there's not much really to talk about right now. <laughs> sure. I mean, after the first quarter, that was, that was game over. Uh, Ezekiel, Al Ezekiel Elliott uh, kind of showed why Urban Meyer heavily recruited him, you know, after two plus years, 162 yards, two touchdowns, all coming in one half. Uh, Mark, I'll start with you. What did you see from Ezekiel Elliott? Uh, I think you saw the future Ohio State running back. I think Dontre Wilson is going to be an H-back. He's going to be an athlete out there. But mm -hmm. I think Ezekiel Elliott is the running back of the future. I, I mean, he's passing even the guys who are older than him right now, I think, because people are really excited about him. I think there's still, uh, obviously, Jordan Hall and Hyder in front of him. And then there's yeah, Rod but Smith. but they're in their last year. So. And then there's uh, Warren Ball. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I... I just think Ezekiel Elliott, I mean, he's just looking good, and he's supposed to be this good, and he showed it. I mean, I know it's FAMU, but I think in the coming years, this is the running back, which is something Ohio State hasn't had. I mean, they don't all – you would think with such a big university, they could just plug in a running back every year, but they do struggle with it slightly to not have the best talent at running back, whereas mm -hmm. they do have some of the top talent every year at every other position. And yeah. I think Ezekiel Elliott has that chance to be one of the, you know, one of the best tailbacks recently. I, mean, I absolutely agree. I actually picked Elliott to be my game breaker for the pregame wow. because I expected us to be killing them. And have, yeah, you know, it was either between him and Warren Ball. And I just I've liked what I've seen out of Elliott. He had six yards of carry entering that game, and then he even scored a third touchdown that was called back later. That's so, true. You know he because that was a holding call. Right. That's right. He, he showed mm -hmm. absolute agility and power. He's got the whole package that you want from a running back. Yeah, I just, I just want to uh, throw out there, those 162 yards and two touchdowns all came in the second half. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's incredible for a true freshman running back. Uh, last question. This is just kind of something funny that I want to throw in there. Uh, does Coach Meyer really deserve to give that referee scholarship from <laughs> Jordan Hall? Just like one of the <laughs> probably the, the funniest – most best blocks that you're going to see all season. That's a master play by Hall. He even had his hand on the ref and threw him into the yeah. guy perfectly. Poor ref just gets run over, but luckily he was all right. I mean, an experienced offensive line for Ohio State has opened up a lot of holes, but that might be the best downfield block really we've was. seen so far he this really season. Was. I mean, he may have been led by Jordan yeah. Hall, but I mean, it, you know, he's part of the field, and Jordan Hall took advantage of it. That's true. you got to take advantage of any way, you know, to get a block on someone. Uh, but we are going to go ahead to a break. But coming up next is Wisconsin, really the king of the Big Ten. We will tell you our thoughts after this timeout. Now that the non-conference schedule has ended, Ohio State officially moves on to the Big Ten portion of the season, as the Bucs are cur currently holding the nation's longest winning streak with 16 straight. Wisconsin invades the horseshoe in prime time Saturday night to dethrone the unbeaten Buckeyes. And speaking of dethroning, why is Urban Meyer claiming that Wisconsin is the king of the Big Ten? We have a lot of respect for Wisconsin, two great backs. I don't know where the heck they keep getting these guys, but they have great backs, and, and uh, we got our hands full. They have an excellent coach, and uh, in my opinion, they're the king of the Big Ten right now, and, and this is an opportunity to go um, compete with a team that's uh, competed in the Rose Bowl the last few years. I mean, we, we think we know we're the kings, so we're not worried about anybody else. Um, simple as that. 
All right, guys, Wisconsin, Ohio State under the lights in the shoe. The Bucks have won four of the last five meetings against the Badgers. And in my opinion, this is the biggest rival of, for OSU outside of that team up north. Uh, Jimmy, I'll start with you. Is Urban correct calling the Badgers the king of the Big Ten Conference? I mean, technically, Wisconsin has won the last two Big Ten and championships. And they've been to the last two Rose Bowls. And they've Bowls. been to the last two Rose Bowls because of that. Obviously, Ohio State was disqualified from postseason play last season. So they represented the legends or the leaders division mm -hmm. in the Big Ten championship game. I think it's more of a ploy to kind of motivate his own team. The fact that he's giving so much praise to Wisconsin, calling them the king of the Big Ten. Uh, obviously, as you mentioned, Ohio State's won four of the last five against them. And we've known the success they've had the last decade in the conference. Uh, it's pretty clear to me that Wisconsin ha doesn't have the track record that Ohio State does, but the last two years, obviously, they've won. Well, the they've, been, they've been close games, though. You can't deny Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Classics. Yeah, it would be you, Mark. They only allow 10.5 points per game against Jeez. lesser opponents, though, this year in yeah. Purdue. I can't, I can't even remember the other two. They, in the lost Arizona, not as impre or Arizona State, I mean, not as impressive. But uh, I think I agree with Jimmy. It's just a ploy by Urban Meyer to just – get these guys psyched up for this game. I mean, it is an 8 o'clock game, so I don't know how much they need to be psyched up, but they are coming off the 76-point victory, so they yeah. need to keep their heads on straight. They're not word, they're not world killers just yet. Yeah, and, and Mark, let me stick with you. Uh, we talked about the running game for Wisconsin. Uh, Ohio State's running back is, I mean, running game and they're running back. So yeah. It's been spectacular this season, but uh, Wisconsin ranks third in the nation in rushing offense. If you were to name the top five running backs, in the Big Ten Conference, maybe even the country, uh, Melvin Gordon and James White's probably going to be your top two. So uh, both of these guys are average, uh, rushing over 100 yards on the ground. Just how disruptive are these two backs going to be for the Silver Bullets? Uh, I think it's going to be, you know, it's definitely going to be something that, that's going to be the defensive game plan. Um, mm -hmm. Getting Adolphus Washington and Michael Bennett back on the D-line is obviously going to help. They really didn't need to play against FAMU, so it's, they weren't really out with, like, terrible injuries. It was just mm -hmm. wide play, but... Having them back is going to be good. Um, they're, they're just going to be two backs that you have to account for them getting yards, just like in the Cal game. Cal was going to get yards, but just hold them out of the end zone, and that's what the Silver Bullets need to do. I mean, I absolutely agree. These two running backs are among the talented in, in the country, as you mentioned, not just this conference. And last time we ran into John Clay, he had a huge game against us. And that was, 2010. And that was a big part of the upset that they had over us was because of John Clay and James White was still there back then as well. And Jeez. the two of them combined. How long have been there right yeah. now? <laughs> so the two of them combined for over 100 yards, or over 200 yards yeah. combined that game, 100 each. And if that happens again today, or on Saturday, that's going to be a huge problem for Ohio State. Now, technically, the 2010 game doesn't exist because it was <laughs> sanctioned. So a Buckeye fan could say the game never happened. So I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, let's, let's shift over to the Badger defense. Uh, just 10.5 points per game all season. Uh, as for the opponents they played, uh, you can take that how you want it, I guess. Uh, this is a legit Wisconsin defense, and it's without a doubt the toughest they will face all season up to this point. Uh, would you agree with that, Jimmy? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. They, of course, they had two shutouts against UMass and uh, an FCS school, yeah. so <laughs> you can kind of throw those out of the equation. But mm -hmm. even against Arizona State, their defense played well, and uh, they had a lead for most of that game before choking it I mean, away. It's a game they should have won. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, we mentioned the referee yeah, fiasco yeah, last year. That, yeah. But, uh, you know, this is the best team, best defense we're going to face by far. I mean, Cal's pass defense, as Cal is the best defense we've played so far, they're 101st in total pass defense right now. So Ohio State's going to have to run the ball. They're going to have to throw the ball. And the, down, the balance is going to be the most important thing for the offense. Yeah, and lucky for Ohio State, they are more than capable of having balance. They have, a, you know, a stable of running backs. They have great wide receivers. They have Hiram in the tight end. They have Braxton Miller. And now apparently they do have Kenny Guyton. So I don't know. I just think that this defense is good. Their um, points per game average is definitely going up against the Buckeyes. The Buckeyes putting up 50 points in all four of their games. I don't think they're going to score quite that much, but I think they can definitely get around this very good Wisconsin defense. Okay, we mentioned the game is in prime time. Uh, Ohio State, that environment in Ohio Stadium is nothing mm. like a noon kickoff. If we, <laughs> I'm, All three of us, we were at Nebraska last season, the, the one under the lights. I'm sure you were too. Right, all of us? Yeah. Uh, yes. No, actually, I missed that game. I did not have tickets last year. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, it was a 63-38 win. It, it mm. broke the attendance record at Ohio Stadium, and it's it was the loudest game I heard all last season. I was down there on the field filming, so you 
my ears were eardrums were pretty much busted. But that's what Wisconsin is probably going to run into mm-hmm. in this game on Saturday. And how tough is that environment going to be uh, for the Badgers? Uh, Mark, I'll start with you on that. Uh, I mean, it's going to be louder than anybody can expect because the number one factor and why I think it's going to be super loud as compared to the other games this year is the other games this year were not good. They just weren't. So everybody's really excited. Not only is it a night game, it's the first game that's going to be good. It's going to be competitive. And the Buckeyes, Braxton Miller returns. All these students are just going to be screaming their heads off. Now you got Carlos Hyde. Yeah. Had one game under his belt. So, yeah, pretty much almost everyone's healthy. What about you, Jimmy? Yeah, everyone's healthy. Everyone's back from suspensions finally. This is the Buckeye team that we all signed up for. And, you know, they came in here two years ago. And they were heavy favorites against us, and the crowd was in it the entire you game. Yeah, you can't as forget loud about as 2011. Ever. Yeah. I mean, even even my freshman year, 2010, when Penn State was a night game, Penn State wasn't mm-hmm. highly ranked or anything, but I was still just an incredible atmosphere. And it's completely different from an eight o'clock to a twelve o'clock game, especially the student section. They get to sleep in. They, they don't have to wake in. up yeah. early. <laughs> They're going to be loud and rowdy the entire night. Mm-hmm. And uh, here's one more before we go, and this is like completely unrelated to everything. But like, do you miss Brett Bielema on the opposing? sidelines for Wisconsin uh, is it weird not seeing him there anymore I mean he was such a great heel in the Big Ten you, you really need that villain so I was just wondering do you guys you guys miss him on that opposing sideline for Wisconsin uh, I mean as an Ohio State fan yeah as a, no. as a Buckeye fan no but <laughs> not not that much because uh, but I don't know they really haven't skipped a beat without him so maybe it would be better if he was still there it's still you know up in the air whether they're gonna be just as good in the Big Ten play but mm-hmm. Brett Bielema was a good um, anti-Ohio State like figure. He was a great villain. Yeah. And I think that was what was great for this rivalry that's still developing. You know? But Brady so. Hoke has stepped into that role very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but Brady Hoke is also isn't stupid with you know the media and PR wise. Yeah. That's Brett Bielema was doing. You know, going on radio, taking shots at Urban Meyer for recruiting and things like that. <laughs> like Buckeye fans wanted to hate him so much, and they did. So Jimmy, what about you? I, mean, I think everyone hated him. I think Wisconsin students even hated him to an extent. And, <laughs> They're lucky to have Gary Anderson, an Urban Meyer disciple, mm. at the helm there, and he's going to lead them to a lot of success in the few, next couple of years, I think. All right. Hopefully, I Brady Hoke's a little smarter than Brett Bielema, <laughs> but, but I, I, think, I think every team needs that great opposing heel, sure. you know? So, Well, coming up next, where did the Big Ten fall in the polls this week? We will have those numbers and our predictions around college football after the break. Taking a look at the polls this week, Ohio State stays the same in both. The AP and Coach is at number four and three. Undefeated Northwestern comes in at 17th and 16th. Michigan drops again for a second straight week at 18th and 17th. And Wisconsin sneaks in the top 25, ranked 23rd in the AP, 24th in the coaches. So despite a 76-0 blowout for Ohio State, guys, um, Ohio State doesn't move. But week one, Oregon moves against Nickel. Was it Nickel State or Nicholas State? Nickel State. Nickel State. State. And I remember Ohio, uh, they did score one touchdown, but Oregon still put over 50 against them. Then they jumped to number two. So, I mean, is it right for Ohio State, you know, staying at number four and number three, or are they just getting no love from the coaches and uh, the media? I didn't think it's a combination of the two, but I didn't think that we learned anything about the Buckeyes in the 76 nothing blowout. But back when we were talking about Oregon, I also said we didn't learn anything about Oregon. A lot of people are riding that Oregon bus right now, though, and some people are saying they should be ranked first in the country. So, you know, it's... That's a conversation that comes up every year with yeah, Oregon, Yeah, that's true. But. I just, I, I don't see why Ohio State deserved to move up, really. I mean, they're fine at four right now. It's not a big concern yet, but it's going to become a concern. We'll get to that later as we talk about Big Ten play as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I think if it's meant to happen, Ohio State is going to move back up in the polls. they got to win the games that are in front of them now. I mean, they, they won their first four games. That's all you need to worry about. The AP and the coaches poll, they're a little skewed anyways. Everything, you know, the computers kind of mm-hmm. even it out too, where I think Ohio State's going to have a little bit stronger schedule than Oregon. I mean, Oregon's got, what, Stanford? And Stanford's going to be the, the deciding that, factor of yeah. who really gets in that title game out of if there's three undefeateds, even four undefeateds. Like, that, that game's going to probably be the biggest – Game of the year. Yeah, after the Bama and m game ba- being over yeah. and things mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that is because I mean, that's going to be one of the last top five match. I think it's going to be the last top five match of the game, or top five match of the season. I don't see any more coming up. Yeah, unless so, yeah. other people move up. You know, probably the SEC title will be mm-hmm. in the top five. But. Okay, uh, four Big Ten teams in the top twenty-five this week. Uh, Michigan State's loss to the Irish knocks them out. Uh, Nebraska's been unranked for a couple of weeks now, and uh, out of all the Big Ten teams that. Big Ten teams that played last week. Who was the most disappointing in the conference last Saturday? Jimmy, I'll start with you. I'm going to pick a team that's ranked, actually. I'm going to pick Michigan. Uh, Michigan's looked horrible the last two weeks. De- yeah. uh, Devin Gardner is turning the ball over like crazy. He's actually lead- leading all of college football with 10 turnovers. Two butt fumbles. <laughs> that happened in that game against Utah. <laughs> but that's what you expect from a defensive yeah. tackle playing quarterback. Right. Number 98. Number 98. That 98, <laughs> it's, it's throwing me off so bad. So, you know, they could have easily lost Akron. They could have lost the UConn. Those are two teams that you, or Michigan should be destroying. And they were on the knock. They were knocking on the door of the top ten, and now they found themselves they buried. Were ranked eleventh. Sure. In the AP. After that Notre Dame win, now they're buried all the way, almost out of the top twenty. And uh, Ohio State needs a team to sneak into that top ten to get them another big matchup this season. And it looks like Michigan was going to do that for them, but it's looking now like they're not. Yeah, I mean Michigan really needs to bounce back. I'm not sure what they've been distracted with. If it was a Notre Dame hangover, but. Uh, I'm going to go with, actually, I'm most disappointed in Michigan State. I don't think Notre Dame is that good. I mean, look at how they struggled against Purdue. I think Michigan State could have won that game mm-hmm. and, you know, kind of moved up and m- made a run at the, uh, their division in the Big Ten. But now they're just they're not looking good, and I'm a little disappointed in them. Um, I'm, I'm going to agree with you, Jimmy. I'm going to go with Michigan. Like, I, I think we knew Michigan State was just going to be really bad. I mean, look – I'm not knocking their offensive coordinator, but look who he is. <laughs> I mean, I followed the fake version of him on Twitter. That's how, that's how bad it is. But struggling against Akron, that's a team that won one game in two years. I, I think it was one game in two one years, FBS right? One FBS game in two years. One FBS game in two years. And They've then, lost like 18 straight 18, road games. Yeah, and then the UConn game, I, there's really no excuse for it. I'm not just saying that because we, we're students at Ohio State. Right. And, yeah. You know, and the student body hates Michigan, but. I just can't yeah. come up with really an explanation for where Michigan is at in I those last either. two games. And, you know, and I want to touch on that just one second. Uh, with the Big Ten losses, including Michigan State, Ohio State, I mean, Mich- not Michigan State, Michigan barely winning. I mean, it feels like a loss to them. And the, sure. How much they've dropped in the polls, it's a loss. Yeah. Um, for Ohio State's chances at a national title, do they need the Big Ten to win as many games as possible? And do Ohio State fans even have to root for Michigan if they're wanting to get into that number one, number two spot in the polls? I think the number one thing that's hurt Ohio State is beat Nebraska not being good this year because Ohio State already plays Michigan and Northwestern, and those look like the two favorites to play Ohio State in mm-hmm. the Big Ten title game. So with Nebraska not being good, that really hurts Ohio State because if Nebraska was good, and won out and like went to the Big Ten title game, then Ohio State gets to play another good Big Ten opponent in the title game that they don't play in the regular season. But without Nebraska really doing anything, it's just going to be a rematch, it looks like, in the Big Ten title game. Yeah, I mean, Ohio State's going to be a touchdown favorite in every game they play from here on out, at least, minimum. They're a seven-point favorite against Wisconsin, so uh, they do need help. They need to win. As we mentioned, Oregon could run the table. Clemson or Florida State could run the table. Even if Oregon loses to Stanford, Mm -hmm. then Stanford could leapfrog Ohio State. They're going to need quality wins on their schedule. And now the fact that the they need t- those top 25 sure, wins, they really do. They need top 10 wins as well. And it doesn't look like anybody's going to get to that top 10. So the, the problem now is that they're going to have to destroy pretty much everybody they play they to make to. a statement. Yeah. You know, it's going to be like Louisville almost. Louisville is going to have to win every game by 70. And they still probably wouldn't be considered for a national title. Mm-hmm. It's not quite that bad in, in the Big Ten. But you mentioned only four ranked Big Ten teams right now. And I mean, that could decrease as the season goes along. Yeah, and here's what I said. I put something out on Twitter a couple weeks ago about this, but Ohio State fans need to root for Michigan. As painful as that set, as that sounds, 
because you need a top 10 win on your schedule, right. especially if it comes at the end of the season on the road, when, on the road in the big house. Yeah. You need that statement win. And then if you play them again next week, they're still going to be in the top 15. So if they come into that game, you know, nine and one, eight and two. Yeah, the problem mm-hmm. with Michigan right now is they're looking like they might lose to a Minnesota or an Iowa in the Big Ten oh, of the season. You know, unfortunately, that's that's what it's going to look like. But if there are three undefeated teams and Stanford and Oregon, whoever beat up on each other, mm-hmm. they're undefeated and an SEC is undefeated. I, Guess who's it on sucks the as it says this. Yeah. Ohio State's not going to get in. Guess who's on the All outside right. looking in. Yeah, in that that's, that's even exactly a one light, what's going to happen. Even a one-loss SEC team could. Absolutely. A oh, one-loss yeah. SEC team who lost to a top five yeah. team in the SEC. In Oregon or Stanford, whoever beats each other on that, they're going to get in. And Ohio State's not. That's why you have to root for Michigan. Mm-hmm. So I, that's, that's just my two cents on it. So let's get to our predictions in the show. Uh, only two Big Ten games this week. Only uh, six teams total playing. Two of them were playing non-conferences. Uh, Ohio State, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota are the two Big Ten games. So let's start with Iowa, Minnesota. Uh, Jimmy, I'll start with you. What is your prediction? Oh, yeah, just real quick. Nice for the Big Ten schedule to give Northwestern a week off before the big nighttime <laughs> showdown with us. That's true. But that's another story. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm going to go with the undefeated Minnesota. I don't trust Iowa's freshman quarterback. He's been struggling a lot, but... Iowa has surprised me at 3-1. and one. I didn't expect them to be this good out of the gate. Hmm. Yeah, the uh, loss to Northern Iowa was disappoint- uh, Was Northern Illinois at the beginning of the season was disappointing for Iowa. But Iowa 1-0 and in rivalry games this year, winning the Cyhawk against Iowa State. That's true. Uh, blowing out a, an FCS team last week. And this coming into another rivalry game against Minnesota for the Floyd of Rosedale. Floyd of Rosedale. So I have to ask you what was that? Pick. <laughs> a big, giant bronze pick. So I got the Hawkeyes. <laughs> um... I'm going to take Iowa 21-13 over Minnesota. I think Minnesota really hasn't had a true test yet. They're in the Big Ten. Uh, it may be in Minneapolis, but we'll, we'll see. It's going to be close. 21-13 is what I got. It's going to be an interesting got. game. Okay, sure. let's, let's move on to the SEC. 21-ranked uh, Ole Miss at number one Alabama. Uh, Mark, I'll go ahead and start with you on this one. Uh, what's this game going to look like? Uh, I mean, Ole Miss kind of taking the place of Mississippi State last year, you know, sneaking into the top 25, but you got to play an SEC schedule then once you do that. Especially SEC West. Yeah, yeah and Alabama, I just, I don't know, they, they've looked really good. I don't really see them not playing well. 35-10 Alabama, something like that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be ugly. Uh, yeah. Alabama's going to destroy them, and I don't think it'll even be a game. Ole Miss will put up some yards. We've seen Alabama, its defense has been – kind of spotty at times this year, which has been somewhat surprising. They gave up over 500 yards to Texas A&M. So that's obviously an elite offense, though. And Ole Miss doesn't have that kind of firepower. So I expect a three or four touchdown game in this one. You know, I think Ole Miss will be a top 10 team in about three years. That recruiting class they brought in, top three, top five. Some um, some websites had them at number one. Yeah. So three years we talk about this game. Ole Miss might win, but uh, this season I got Alabama 42, Ole Miss 7. It's, (laughs) you know, it it looks like it can be a potential for an upset, but Alabama's just, they're just too good this year. I mean, they're going to be good every year, too. Uh, Probably, this is probably the game of week in college football. Uh, Number six, LSU at number nine, Georgia. Uh, Jimmy, I'll start with you. Biggest game on the schedule for Georgia right now is this LSU game. They need to win after that Clemson loss. They're at home against the Tigers. They got everything going for them. If they can get through this game, it's pretty light until the next couple of weeks down the road. So this is the big game for them. But I just think LSU is too good, and I don't. I haven't seen enough from Georgia's defense that allows me to pick an upset here. So I'm going to pick LSU. Uh, I like LSU too in this game. I think. Uh... Georgia, you know, they already dropped their one game of the year, which is what they always kind of do when they have big expectations. Mm-hmm. But I just think right now LSU's defense is good enough to shut down Georgia's uh, offense, while LSU's offense has gotten better this year and Georgia's defense isn't as good. So that kind of evens out to the point where LSU does win. Um, I'm going to go 13-10 overtime, LSU over Georgia and Athens. Uh, you know, those top 10 SEC games, they're always very low scoring. There's just a lot of defense. I know we talked about Georgia's defense is really bad, but the, I think they'll come to play against a top 10 team. Uh, I think LSU sneaks away with a field goal in overtime, and we got a 13-10 score in Georgia's national championship hopes. They're done after <laughs> that. I mean, maybe an SEC title out of the East, but I don't think we're going to see much out of that. Uh, probably the second biggest game of the week, Oklahoma at Notre Dame, Oklahoma's at 20, Oklahoma's 14th, Notre Dame's at number 22 after that Michigan State win. Uh, Mark, who do you have? 
Um, I said it earlier in the show. I haven't been that impressed with Notre Dame this year. I don't think that, I think they're overranked. They come in most seasons overranked. They're just ranked every year. It's just better for them to be ranked on the cover of magazines and things like that because they have one of the largest fan bases. And I think Oklahoma Bell has been a great uh, switch for quarterback, and mm-hmm. I think he Bell dozes right over Notre Dame, and I think Oklahoma wins this one handily, and Notre Dame finally drops out of the top 25, which they've been very close to doing <laughs> very each of the last two weeks. Yeah, Notre Dame's definitely been more battle-tested, playing three Big Ten teams each of the last three weeks, but uh, Oklahoma is clearly the better team on paper, and Notre Dame went into Oklahoma and destroyed them last year, so Oklahoma has a little bit of motivation to pay them back. They're going to come in as favorites, and I haven't really been impressed with what I've seen from Notre Dame either. I expected them to be much better than they've shown, so I'm going to pick Oklahoma. I do think it'll be a lot closer than it's expected, though. Yeah, I'm going to go 28-14 Oklahoma at Notre Dame. Uh, obviously, the quarterback position right now for Notre Dame, that's not the guy who they wanted, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. it would be a different story if uh, I'm trying to think of the, the kid's name. Ever Golston. Golston. Ever Golston, yeah. If he was there, then it'd be. I think there'd be a different outcome. But I'm going to go 28-14 Oklahoma over Notre Dame. Um, All right, and here's the game we've been talking about the whole entire show. Number 23, Wisconsin at number four, Ohio State. Uh, Buckeyes, seven and a half point favorite at home. Do the Buckeyes cover? You know, the the key to this game is going to be rushing. Wisconsin's third nationally. Ohio State is sixth nationally, actually, surprisingly, averaging 315 yards a game. So if Wisconsin's able to run the ball in Ohio State, that's obviously going to be their game plan. Joel Stave is a complete liability at quarterback at this point for Wisconsin. Mm. They're going to have to be able to run the ball, and if they can run the ball, it's going to disrupt Ohio State's offensive tempo as well. So that's going to be their game plan. If Ohio State stops the run, they're going to destroy Wisconsin, I think. Mm. But I don't expect them to just completely stop an offense that's rushed for over 325 yards a game. I do expect Ohio State to cover, but if Braxton Miller struggles and Kenny Guyton, that situation, I mean, it could be, it could be any <laughs> kind of thing here. I do think Wisconsin has a chance at the upset, but I do like Ohio State to win by two touchdowns. Yeah, I think Ohio State covers as well. I think it's going to be one of those games where Ohio State kind of just takes a lead, a seven-point to one-touchdown lead, and they hold that for most of the game. Wisconsin kind of threatens late, but then Ohio State scores a touchdown right near the end of the game to win by about 14 or 10 or something like that. And uh, I agree with you, everything you said. It's going to be all about shutting down that rushing attack by Wisconsin, and their quarterback isn't really that scary either. I mean, Guyton has almost better numbers than him in two and a half games. I mean, he has better numbers except for, I think, yards. So you're going to go with, well, obviously you're going to go with Ohio State. Yeah, Ohio State. they're going to cover? Yeah, I think Ohio State wins by 10 or 14 points. All right, this game to me is sounds, this feels awful similar to Ohio State and Nebraska last year under the lights. Mm -hmm. I am going to go 49-21 Ohio State over Wisconsin. I think it's going to be very heavy on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, both teams will probably rush for over 200 yards collectively. Mm -hmm. But remember what Nebraska looked like, 63-38. You know, so that's why I think that's why I'm going to go with 49-21 Ohio State. And if Ohio State wins by four touchdowns, they'll likely jump Clemson in the polls as well. Yeah. And then make a statement to the country if they come out and win by 28 against Wisconsin and Braxton Miller's return. So that is really what Ohio State needs. Because I, I think that's one thing that limits Ohio State in that ranking, just going back to it real quick, is the fact that, I mean, they were undefeated last year, but they were close. I mean, there were a lot of close games, the Indiana game, the Purdue game, and those are two not very good teams. Absolutely. So uh, they need to make a statement in this Wisconsin game, and I would I would agree with you that they would jump Clemson prime, if they did that. Prime time on ABC, mm-hmm. and that's what helped Clemson out beating Georgia. Everybody saw Everyone's that. watching. And yeah. everyone will be watching this game. And if Ohio State comes out, jumps down Wisconsin's throat, and destroys them, You'll see them move up in the polls. I have it. I guarantee it. All right. Well, um, that's going to do it. Uh, Jimmy, Mark, thanks for coming on this week. I'm sure I'm going to see one of you guys <laughs> back on the show next week. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be a good game this weekend. Yep. Yep. All right. And that's going to do it for us today on Buckeye Football Weekly. Tune in to us next week as we will have a new panel, and we will be talking about what happened in the Wisconsin game and previewing the week of the Northwestern game. We'll see you later.